I've been waiting to do what the Lord has told me to do tonight uh, for about a week. Uh, I want to uh, impart something tonight. If you, I'm not expecting you to shout a lot tonight. Um, if you have pens and paper, you might want to write a lot tonight. And if you don't, you might want to watch it or listen to it over and over because we're going to talk about the perfect pattern of prayer tonight. The perfect pattern of prayer. Uh, and we're going to go into praying to the tabernacle. And I promise you one thing, your prayer life, if you get a hold of this, your prayer life will go through the roof tonight. And you'll never be the same again. In fact, I used to title this message after tonight, I'll never be the same. Exodus chapter 25 and Hebrews chapter 8. We're going to go to Exodus 25 and verses 8 and 9. And then Hebrews chapter 8 verses 3 through 5. Exodus 25, 8 and 9, Hebrews 8, 3 through 5. I'll be giving you a lot of stuff tonight, so just get what you can, and I can answer questions later or something. Exodus 25, verse 8, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, like he's dwelling among us tonight. According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle. Someone say the pattern of the tabernacle. And the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 3 through 5. Hebrews 8, 3 through 5. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts, sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that, he, that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Verse 5 serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things as Mo Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for see saith he that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount now I'm going to talk to you tonight about the perfect pattern of prayer I want you to get your spirit open so God can help you get prayers answered we're going to go deep tonight so just get ready. Look back, Lord, I pray right now for people to have divine attention. I pray that people will be connected to what you're about to impart tonight and that you would take us this atmosphere that we feel. We know we're near the Holy of Holies. And I pray that this would go home with us tonight and this atmosphere would start to dwell in our houses. In Jesus' name I pray. And somebody said amen. You may be seated. When you pray, you need to have a plan. God is organized, and it is disrespectful to come to God unorganized in your prayer. Now, there are times we come and we pray desperate prayers, obviously, but I'm talking about in your daily prayer life, if you do not have a plan of how to pray, well, that's why we're talking tonight, uh, but you need to have some kind of plan when approaching God. Here's why. If you just wing it every time, you won't break through every time, number one. You'll fall asleep a lot of the times. You'll repeat yourself over and over, and you won't get anywhere. And you'll pray the same things over and over. And they'll usually be your needs, your requests, your situations, and then you're done. So there are different patterns of prayer you find in the Bible, patterns for people the Lord's Prayer, for instance, and you hear that all the time, people praying about our Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We, there, that's a pattern of prayer where you take each statement and you pray certain things about that. And then the armor of God prayer, where you pray the armor of God on your life when it comes to warfare. And then the, I believe the perfect pattern of prayer is the tabernacle prayer. This is a model. The tabernacle was what the Lord told Moses to build in the wilderness as his sanctuary, and he would come out of heaven and dwell among the people. The tabernacle in the wilderness was a physical replica of the tabernacle that is in heaven. And so God told him, what's in heaven? I want you to build and design on the earth. And if you get it physically in the earth, I'll come down and I'll dwell among the people. There are 40 verses that deal with creation, and there are over 400 verses that deal with the tabernacle. 
and you are about to learn how to pray. And when I heard this the first time from old Elder G.A. Mangan, when he, he had all these things, he prayed this every day for, what, 60 years, Bishop? Uh, and when you, when you heard this, when I heard this, it blew my mind because I thought I had a prayer life. I thought I was doing right. And then when I realized the depths and the places I could go in prayer by praying the tabernacle, it, I, it, I've never been the same again. And so I started doing, in fact, uh, this is just a commercial, but I did it one time for 250 straight days. And in that process, that's when God called me on the 40-day fast and all that stuff started shifting in my life. It started with the tabernacle prayer. It just came into my life. I was desperate to get a hold of God, tired of not breaking through, tired of not hearing his voice. And then when this came to me, I studied all the things that the elders spoke about, and I wrote them all down and as much as I could. And I'm going to present that to you the best that I can tonight. And if you have some writing information, write it down what you can, but get it in your spirit because this is going to help you pray like you've never prayed before. Most of us pray to God, bring our list, bring our needs, and then wonder why God does not answer them. That's because we are approaching God the wrong way. There's a way to approach God if you want God to do what you're asking him to do. Can I get a witness in this building. You must come to him and approach him. He is a king. He's not your friend. He's not your brother. He's not your peer. He's your father, and he's the king of heaven and earth. So approaching him is very, very important how you do it. So you enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and you enter into his courts with praise. Whether you're coming into church or you're getting up tomorrow morning and you're coming into your prayer meeting, always, El Shataya, always enter the prayer meeting praising God and thanking God for what he's done. That's cute little golf clap. Anyone can come beg him for the stuff, but he's far more likely to hear you when you do what the word said. And the word said, when you come before me, you enter praising me. You come before me thanking me. I don't want to do something for you if you're not thankful for what I've already done for you. Is there anybody thankful for what the Lord has done for them? Enter into his gates with them. That's why when you come to church, you don't come to it. You come to praise. Oh, shut up. You come to worship. You come to adore because that's Bible. So you enter the tabernacle with praise and thanksgiving. Now, there are three layers to the tabernacle. There's the outer court. There's the inner court. And there's the holy of holies. The outer court, the first piece of furniture that was placed in the tabernacle was the biggest piece of furniture. Five square cubits long and three square cubits high. It was, it was far greater in size than any other piece of furniture put in the tabernacle. In fact, you could place all the other pieces of furniture inside this first piece, which was the brazen altar of repentance. There was no steps up to this altar. There was an altar that you came to first. That's a very powerful statement, by the way. There are no steps to repentance. You just bring repentance to God. You don't have 17 steps before God forgives you. You come to the altar and you repent of your sins. That's how things start to change in your life. And so on this brazen altar, the priest had to offer a sacrifice, had to kill an animal, tie it to the horns of the altar, set it on fire, and burn it before he was ever allowed to do anything else. Flesh had to die at the brazen altar of repentance. Step number one in your prayer life, you, after you enter praising God, you must go to the brazen altar and you must start repenting of your sins. It's not a time to ask for a new car, to ask for a new job. It's time to deal with the things in you that no one knows about. It's quiet, but that you need to deal with. It was a death place. It was a place of slaughter. It was bloody at the altar it's not pretty at the brazen altar you don't want to do this with your friends around 
Because at the brazen altar, you're going to call yourself every name in the book. You're going to deal with every issue that you know you struggle with. Because at the altar, the only place where flesh can die is at an altar of repentance. And so you don't just bypass it. Lord, forgive me for all my sins. You stop, Hoshata, and you deal with what you have in your mind. Whether it's pride or rebellion or lust or greed, whatever it is, if it's unforgiveness, if it's bitterness if it's anger you kill that before you take on your day you don't pray for brother so and so you don't pray for sister so and so you don't pray for your wife to repent or your husband to repent you're dealing with you only right now and until flesh dies you stay in the flesh so you'll go into your day in the flesh if you do not kill your flesh at the beginning of the day. When I get up at the beginning of the day and I kill flesh, it's a far better day with God than it is on the days where I get up and I do not kill the flesh. That altar is the most important place of prayer it's the place where they would light the fire and it would be lit daily morning noon and night the fire was burning and this is where flesh was killed and if you want bible go read romans 8 36 or 6 verse 6 colossians 3 2 5 and 8 galatians 5 24 first corinthians 15 31 where you have to die daily the bible said i present my body a living sacrifice in in other words, every day, shokata, man, there's anointing up here. When I come before God, don't let me come with my list. Let me come saying, Lord, kill everything impure that's in my heart, in my mind, in my spirit, in my life. I cannot face the day with the sin in my heart. That makes sense? That's why he said, before you go anywhere, in my tabernacle, which is a replica of what I've got in heaven, you come to that brazen altar of repentance. And he wrote that he said this, and I wrote it down. How much Shekinah glory do you want in the Holy of Holies? For what you put on the altar of repentance determines what you will find later in the Holy of Holies. At the end of this journey in a moment, a little while, you're going to see about how God will answer prayers on a daily basis and do breakthroughs on a daily basis and feel God like you've never felt before. But the most important thing is not skipping by your repentance. Even we pray for the Holy Ghost, if you've noticed that, Every time I've had the bishop lead us in repentance. You know why? Because we can't just bypass repentance and expect the miraculous. So from the top down, we take repentance seriously and we expect God to forgive us. And then God, and guess what? God blesses the repentance. He did it Sunday when 37 people were filled with the Holy Ghost after we repent. That's why Peter said, repent and be baptized. Every Don't even try to be saved if you're not going to go to the altar of repentance first. So the pl first play, and it's going to be a different time lengths each day you might deal with different things each day there might be something you deal with every day for a while but you go there every day and you repent every day and when you're done repenting you've put it on the altar or you've put it on the cross whatever however you want to term it you, you, you place it down the more that you burn the, the more flesh that you slay the more that you kill at the altar the greater your breakthrough will be throughout the tabernacle prayer oh it's good right now when you're done repenting the next place the priest would go was the labor of water the labor of water was where he would wash the blood from the flesh that he just killed. And he would wash the blood off of his hands and off of his feet. Ephesians talks about this. And when you go before the Lord after, after you've repented, this, the Bible talks about we are washed by the word of God.
God. So here's what you do after you've repented. You get your Bible out and you read your Bible until you wash your flesh from the sin of your life. When the priest would look into that brazen labor of water, he could see his reflection from the copper, from the brass. He could see his face until he put his hands in the water and the blood from his hands caused the water to cause, stop him from seeing his reflection. In other words, when you wash yourself in the word of God, you repent and you read your Bible until the flesh is no longer in the picture and you feel God cleansing you of things in your life. You're not done at the labor until the flesh is gone. Well, I'm going to get it real, real straight with you. For those of you who read your Bible once every five days, when the preacher takes his text on the screen, haven't brought your Bible to church in six years. You cannot please God and expect God to answer prayers when you do not let the word wash you. You cannot expect the word to wash you if you never read it. And the greatest place the word will wash you is in your mind. Oh, it's going to be quiet. But if you've got an impure mind, if you've got thoughts all the time that are sinful, you need to get in your Bible more and let the Word... Wa I know some of you don't like that. That's why you're not responding. But that Word will wash the thoughts, whether it's fear, whether it's lust, whether it's pride, whatever it is. If you let the Word get in you, it will wash away the elements of the flesh. So it might be Psalms 51 for you every day. You don't know where to read to, to get washed. Just go to Psalms 51. That's the chapter David wrote when he had sinned. Created me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. He, all these verses. Forgive me of my transgression. I take not your Holy Spirit from me. He's being open before God. If you don't know what to read to repent, just read that. And if, if you still feel carnal, keep reading. But read something. Read until... You're dealing with you. Here's why. You're about to pray for everybody else. You're not, you're not even praying for your stuff yet. Oh, no. We don't just go repent and then pray for us. We're about to repent and go pray for everybody else. But before we are eligible to pray for anyone else, we must remove the fleshly part of us so that what? The Spirit of God can pray through us for other people. I can't pray for you if I'm not dealing with me. I am praying from a fleshly perspective if I'm praying for you and not dealing with me. So I get up and I deal with me before I can pray for you. And so what the priest would do after he washed his hands, Bishop, and you know more than I do on this, after he washed his feet, then he would put on the priestly garments. He's about to represent men to God and God to men. And on those priestly garments, there were at the base of the garment, at the hem of the garment, there were, there were fruits and bells that were tied on the hem into the garment. A fruit and then a bell. A fruit and then a bell. This is a sim symbol of the fruits and the gifts of the spirit the fruit obviously the fruit of the spirit the bell was a symbol of the sound of the spirit why do they wear bells because if you did something wrong as the priest and you tried to go through the tabernacle and you did not go the proper pattern you skipped the altar or you skipped the labor God would kill you before you in anywhere near the inner court. And so they had bells on, not for the priest's sake, but for the people outside the tabernacle to hear that the priest was still alive. They could hear, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. They could hear the sound of ministry in the house of God. They could hear the sound of the priest pleasing God. They could trust what the priest was doing because they heard the sound of life. Here's where you pray for the fruits of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit 
to lead you before you pray for others. Lord, let this day be led by you. Consume me with the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, faith. Let me be consumed with the fruits of the Spirit. If someone meets me today, let them feel the fruits of the Spirit. Let me be led by the gifts of the Spirit. If there's someone needing a word from you or direction, let me be led by your voice. Let me be sensitive as I enter the tabernacle who I'm supposed to pray for this morning. Here we go. And before he would even enter into the inner court, there were five pillars holding up the curtain of the inner court that the priest had to go through these five pillars to get into the inner court. Old G.A. Mangan, who prayed this every day for 60 years, said he, those five pillars are the names of God, wonderful, counselor, mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. And so what he would do is he wouldn't just rush into the inner court. He would stop at all five pillars. Now, this is going to help you big time. This is going to help you pray longer, okay? The first pillar he called wonderful, and he would stop right here, and he would just praise God for having how wonderful he is. You never go wrong telling God you're the wonder of it all. Before I do anything, I want to, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost, I want to exalt you. I could not do anything without you. Here's where you thank God for blessing your family, for giving you health in your body, for protecting you. Here's where you tap into the channel of thanksgiving. As you are, oh, I feel God right now. As you are declaring him to be so good to you it's really hard to complain when you're telling him you're wonderful to me I don't deserve your mercy and I don't deserve your grace and I don't deserve your love but every day that I wake up it's a symbol that you're with me and I feel your mercy and so I'm gonna praise you for how wonderful you are Spend as much time there or as little time there as you want. The more time you spend, the better you feel. Number two, he's wonderful and he's the counselor. Oh boy. Here's where you pray for counsel for your day. Vesta Megan said this, anything you do not bring God into for counsel, hell is authorized to counsel you about. G.A. Mangan would say, he'd say, I would pray right here for everything about my day. Which roads do I take? What time do I leave? Order who I sit by at lunch. Who do I call? What do I do? Order my facial expressions, my responses. Order what I say. And counsel me on this. Counsel me on that. Counsel me on my finances. Counsel me on my health. Counsel me on uh, spiritual matters. You can pray a long time right here for wisdom and guidance and direction. Right now you are telling the Lord, I need you to guide everything about my day. If you've got an encounter or a conversation you're dreading, you need to pray that morning for God to counsel you. He is the counselor. A lot less, a lot more people will need a lot less counsel if they met the counselor every morning. I'm just saying the reason why a lot of people want counsel after church every service is because they don't get God's counsel when they get up to pray in the morning. And none of you are responding right now. And I'm not saying you don't need pastor's counsel. You do. But I'm telling you, if you get up and pray every morning for God to counsel you about every little detail, you wouldn't drain pastor every single service. What should I do here? Should I do this? Let me tell you, if you'll just pray about God directing you, there'll be less drama. Oh, I'm preaching way better than you're responding right now. The truth is a lot of people don't want counsel. They want attention. Oh, that was good, boy. They do. They want attention. And don't ask for counsel when you're not going to obey the counsel. I'm preaching. I'm off my notes, but I'm really feeling good. He's the counselor. So every morning, I need his counsel. 
Lord, on the road, before we drive anywhere, before we drive on, I'm telling him, God, protect us from road rage. <laughs> protect us from accidents, from road construction, from police, from hydroplaning, from engine trouble. I'm, I'm praying counsel for my car. Evangelize a while. You'll do it too. But I'm praying any way possible, protect us, counsel me. I need your thoughts, not mine. And then you go, I'm going to leave you alone. You go to the next pillar, the mighty God. Mm, boy. This is where you begin to praise him and you begin to declare that you know he's true. And here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you begin to worship him. And this is where you pray imprecatory prayers, which are prayers against the enemies of truth. You pray for apostolic doctrine to be released you pray against the spirits of the world can i get real with you right now here's what i do right here i pray against islam i pray against scientology i pray against atheism i pray against satanic cults i pray against tritheism i know some of you are staring at me right now but those are not truth those are things leading people from truth and so i pray god bring those things down destroy those things in people that have preached to in their ears in their minds in this city in this building i don't know who's tapped into what so i just pray against it oh boy you want a prayer life here, here it comes and you just start praying against anything it would exalt itself against the one true god he has all power. You have all authority. You're able to do anything, God. You can save anyone. There's no spirit out there that can conquer you. And you just keep hitting it. Release truth, God. Release your name. Let the name of Jesus be unleashed across this planet. Let the name of Jesus get in every country, in every schoolyard, every job site, every cave, every enemy's territory. Let the truth get loose. You're the mighty God. Post number four, fourth pillar, everlasting father. Here's where you pray for the forgotten, for the suffering. Yo, it's going to get real now because I'm about to find where you all been praying. Here's where you pray for the handicapped, the homeless, the homebound, the institutionalized, the incarcerated, the widows, the widowers. The orphans, the parents trying to make it, single parents, kids with one parent. Oh, you can pray a long time here. And by the way, you can break through here real easy. If you're serious, you want to break through, you can really break through when you start to pray for people that are sick, people that are abandoned, people that have been kidnapped. You want, if you really want to feel something... Stop at the everlasting father pillar for a while and just pray. You're the father that saves when no one else can save. You know where the man is right now on the bridge. You know where the lady is right now with a bottle of pills. You know where that kid is right now in the orphanage trying to cuddle up and there's no blanket. You, you want to pray here, you can pray. It's very easy, Bishop, to tap into intercession right here. And then guess what? Some days you'll pray and you'll be just, and then other days somebody's knee will jump at you. And you can't get their name off your mind. And you begin to weep. Oh God, if you do anything today, heal that guy. Touch that one. I don't know what's going on, but protect him. You see where no one else sees. You love where no one else loves. You see the drunk at the bar. You see the guy hooked on the drugs. You see the gang member. You, you can go all day here, but it's a, how much do you want to pray? He's the everlasting father. That means no matter where, from beginning to end and beyond, he's going to be the dad to everything. He's going to care about what I don't care about. He's going to love where I don't love. He's going to reach where I can't reach. And the fifth pillar is the prince of peace. Now, and I could go back to the everlasting father, but I'm in a hurry here. Prince of peace. And here's where I pray for Israel immediately. Because the Bible said to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So right here, I, you're going to do it like me, but I immediately go into praying for Israel. You should pray for Israel every day. 
Those who bless Israel, I will bless. Those who curse Israel, I will curse. So whether you feel anything or not, pray for Israel. Now I'm telling you the truth. I pray for peace in Israel. Then I pray for peace in America. God, you're the prince of peace. We need peace in that. I pray against terrorism in this nation. I pray against spirits that would rise up to attack our nation, attack our leaders. I pray for peace in the Middle East. We should do this every day, everybody. Someone's got to do it. I know it's quiet and you're like, we're like, I'm just speaking a different language to you. I pray for peace in the church. Peace for our leadership. Peace for our families. Here's where you pray for peace for your spouse. Peace for your kids. Peace for your loved ones. Peace at your job. You can find a whole lot of things to pray. I need the Prince of Peace in that situation, in this situation. We need him in America, in Europe, in Asia. You can pray forever here. We need peace. Now, I haven't even, we have not even gone into the inner court, much less the Holy of Holies. You can spend an hour up to right here or more. That's how much you want to pray. Don't ever say after tonight that you don't. <laughs> you just don't know how. Yeah, you do. I'm leaving it out. And when they would come through that fifth post, now they enter the inner court. And there were different pieces of furniture. In fact, it was set up like a cross. If you, if you, read, if you see the pictures of it. And the first piece of furniture inside the inner court was the candlestick. Why? Because without light, the priest is going there in the dark. So he would take the fire from the brazen altar. The candlestick was the only uh, item that was made without measure. They don't have exact cubits of height and how, how wide it was. It was made with no wood. It was pure gold. And the candlestick, there was oil in the candlestick and the, and the seven, seven different tops of the candlestick. And the priest would light that with the torch and they would light up the entire inner court. And so the oil, obviously, the type of the Holy Ghost, the fire. And so right here, until you light the candlestick, you're blind approaching God. So after you've prayed all those things, you are now praying, God, fill me with your spirit. I need to be a light in this dark world. Set me on fire. Don't let me leave my house a carnal person. But when I leave this place, let people see you in me. Don't let them see me. Oh, I feel God right there. Let them see you. My job is not to show who I am. My job is to show who you are. So I pray, let the oil of the Holy Ghost fill every crevice of me. Let it fill every part of me, of my mind, of my heart. Consume me with your fire. It's real easy to, to get the Holy Ghost right here, by the way. Real easy right here to worship God until you're speaking in tongues. You're the light of the world. Without you, I can't see anything. Without you, I can't go anywhere. Without you, I don't know what I'm doing. I need you to light up my life. I need you to be my eyes. I need you to guide me. I need you for vision. How can I give vision to others when I can't see myself? Set me on fire. Let the light get in me. Burn everything in me that I can't see that's dark. Let the light get in my soul. Make sense? And from there... The priest would go to the table of showbread. Now, table of showbread, 12 loaves of bread on the table, two rows of six. There's two things here about the table of showbread that the elder said. He said, you've got the bread and you've got the table, which holds up the bread. The bread's the word of God. So guess what? You do. You get your Bible back out. Now, before you read your Bible to wash you, remember? Remember? Now you read your Bible to feed you. Why? Because you can't live feeding on the Spirit. You need to feed on the Word. These emotions in the altar are powerful, but they won't keep you till Sunday. Oh, it's quiet. Some of you are looking at me like you're lost right now. And the ones that are lost don't have a prayer life or a reading life. When you pick up your Bible on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, guess what? It sustains you, and you're not coming in starving with a bad spirit Sunday morning, negative and mad at everyone in the church. But when you've been in your Bible, feeding on the Word of God, strengthening yourself. So you, you read here until you're full. You 
reading for strength. Ooh, that verse stands out. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. I received that from, you're reading the promises of God. You're reading whatever the Lord says, and you keep reading until something jumps out. And when something jumps out, that's not your flesh. That's not the devil. That's God saying, this is for you right now. And you take that word and you go into your day. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Or rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I'm going to rejoice today. I, I feel with joy. Why? Because the word fed me this morning. So you read there two chapters, five chapters, 30 chapters. It's different every day. And then you don't just leave the table of showbread. The table holds up the word. So what's the table? That's the ministry. People presenting the word, holding up the word. So now you pray for bishop. You start with bishop. You go to this church, you start with him right there. And you start praying, God, strengthen my bishop today. Give him whatever he needs in his body, his life, his home, his finances, whatever he needs. And you pray for the ministry. And you begin to pray for whoever stands out to you. And then you pray for revival across the world. Pray for the missionaries. Pray for the pastors. Pray for the evangelists. Pray for revival in Europe and in Asia, India, wherever. Your, your, your mind will go all kind of, it'll be different every day. And if, if, if nothing stands out, you just, you just name the place. God, send revival to Australia. Send revival to South America. Every preacher preaching the truth, I pray for them, for their faith, for their family, for their finances. What are you doing? You're driving the devil crazy right now because you're literally praying a covering on people. He's trying to attack. He's trying to destroy. And every time you get up, even though they don't know it, the strength is coming to them from somewhere because someone in Dallas is getting up and instead of praying for themselves, they're saying, God, that missionary in Japan, would you please, oh, I didn't even think about that. Would you please cover him right now? Would you please strengthen him right now? You are praying the table of showbread. Everyone that holds up your word, that left their life to preach your gospel, would you bless them? Would you pray? protect them would you empower them would you give them favor and names will jump out that's why you prayed for the fruits and the gifts of the spirit earlier it's different days different names yesterday morning I, god i'd be praying for pastors in virginia i don't know who i was praying for but it was real deal i was weeping I didn't know who it is i just started with the superintendent name as many names as i could name i said god there's someone i don't know but whoever he is right now, and I began to war for him. I don't even know who I'm praying for, but I know I'm in the spirit. And if you really want to help somebody, get in the spirit. And this is the process of doing it. Is this all right tonight? We're going deep. I mean, this. So when you're done with the table of showbread, you go to the altar of incense. This is the last piece of furniture before the priest would go in the Holy of Holies. Right, Bishop? So this is, this is the last place before. Now, you're ministering to God and to people this entire time, praying for everyone else but you. And this is the last place you're going to minister to the Lord before he ministers to you. Mm. And so here at the altar of incense, they would take that fire from the brazen altar of repentance, and they would begin to light that fire, and they would give God worship. This is where you praise him and give him heart worship, deep worship. This will lead you in inter into intercession for your kids to be saved. For your family to make it. There was four ingredients that they would put in the, for the incense to offer God. Stacti, Annika, Galbanum, Frankincense. They would mix these four ingredients Burn them at the altar of incense. Stacti is an ingredient that comes from a tree, different places of a tree. Anywhere in the tree it can show up. Annika, from the depths of the Red Sea. Some, some theologians say it would come from the scales of fish. Others say it would come from the, the seaweed on the, on the, on the floor of the, of the Red Sea. But it would come from the deepest part of the Red Sea. Galbanum is resin that comes from a tree only when the tree is broken. Frankincense was what they would put early on a child's life, like when the wise men brought frankincense to Jesus. What does it all mean? One, you come anywhere, anytime. Stacti, anywhere in the tree. Annika, from deep places. Galbanum, from broken places. 
frankincense early. What is it? What are you telling God right here? God, I give you any time, anywhere, deep, broken worship early in the morning. Oh boy, this is good. You're telling the Lord right now, I'm giving you, I'm mixing stuff. I'm mixing early morning prayer with the deepest part of my soul. I'm giving you broken worship. I'm nothing without you. In fact, right here, the priest would take off those priestly garments and go back to that white robe that he had at the altar of repentance. Here's where you take off all your titles, all your accolades, all the compliments you get. And yo, Koshata, you're telling the Lord, I'm nothing. I'm <laughs> I'm nothing without you. I worship you. My family needs you. I don't have the answers. I, I love you. I adore you. I bow down to you. You're everything to us. We need you today. We need you in our life. My kids need you today, God. I'm not enough to protect them. In fact, I'm not their protector. You're the protector. You just assigned it to me. I'm nothing without you. Go back to Psalm 51 if you don't believe it. And God said, what pleases God? A broken and a contrite spirit. So when you give God broken, now you're, you're getting close to the holy of holies. You're getting close to where God dwells, where there's no warfare. You're getting close to where it's just going to be you and him. You're getting close to where you can bring. Notice I haven't brought my needs up yet. I'm getting close to the place where I'm allowed to. And so when they would come to the Holy of Holies, the veil covered the Holy of Holies. The veil had four posts holding it up. Elder Megan said, that's Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where the veil was torn in those Gospels. You had access into the Holy of Holies. And this is where you thank him for everything he did and when he came on this earth. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you thank him for every miracle. You thank him for every parable that he taught. For every time he talked about heaven, every time he talked about praying and fasting and giving, you thank him for everything he mentioned, for every time he raised the dead, every time he healed the cripple. You just thank him for things 2,000 years ago, and you're still thanking him for Bartimaeus getting his eyesight. You're still thanking him for Lazarus coming out of the grave. You'll be the only human in your, in your street or in your city probably thanking God for stuff he did way back then. And of course you thank him for the cross. You thank him for Calvary. You thank him for the, what he did for saving you from your sin. Oh, I don't even deserve to be in the Holy of Holies. You're the only one that ripped that veil and now you're letting me have access to you. And they would go on the Holy of Holies. And here's the last thing that they would do before the Shekinah would hit them. They would go. The first thing they'd get in the Holy of Holies was the mercy seat. They put that blood from that sacrifice of repentance on that mercy seat. Everything I repented for, God, I need your mercy in. Everything I repented for way back at the beginning this morning when I prayed, I need your mercy in. Here's where you pray for the mercy of God on your life, on your health, on your kids, on your wealth, on whatever. You pray for the mercy of God. The mercy seat angels are there. This is what that they, they would put that every time, that blood on the mercy. You, you thank God for his blood. Your blood's the only thing that washed away my sin. If your blood wasn't there, I'd be headed to hell right now. I need your blood covering. I need mercy every morning. And after you're done there, I'm hurry. I'm really hurrying because there's so much. You go to the Ark of the Covenant. This is where God dwelt. Now, here we go. Inside the Ark was three things. The pot of manna. The Ten Commandments. And Aaron's rod that budded. Pot of manna. Daily provision. Remember he said, pray, give us this day our daily bread. Now you start to pray for the provision you need. Who's guilty of getting up and saying, we need a financial breakthrough today, God? Seven seconds into the prayer meeting. No one raised their hand here, but I'm still telling the truth. But when you go through this pattern, you don't bring up anything you need until you've addressed everything about you and you've prayed for everyone you could possibly pray for and you've praised him so much that it's all about him 
and you come before him nothing, needing his mercy and grace. And now you say, okay, God, here's the needs that we have. We need this financial need, this family marriage. And you bring the needs for the provision. And next to the pot of manna was the Ten Commandments. Verse 5 were to God. Next 5 were to what you shouldn't do. Here's where you pray, God, don't let me break any of your commandments. Let me live under the covering of your word. If I break it, let your, if I break any commandments, let your mercy and your blood cover me. But I pray that I would live by your law, that I'd live by the word of God, that the word would be my direction today. I wouldn't sin against you with my mouth or with my mind or with my eyes or with my ears or with my heart. I don't Even though you still got needs, you're still reminding God, I want to walk in the spirit when I'm done with this prayer meeting. I want to live pleasing you. I want the word. To, that's why you got to read the Bible. You can't walk in the word if you don't read the word. I want the word to control my thoughts. And then Aaron's rod, the rod that budded, which I can join the message on that with almonds and the blossoms and powerful stuff. But, but the rod was in there, that miracle rod, that rod that he threw down and water turned into blood. And, and he ate the serpents with it. All those different miracles in, the, in Egypt when, when Moses would talk and Aaron would stretch out the rod and miracles would happen. It represents the miraculous, the authority of God. Here's where you start to pray with the authority of the name of Jesus for miracles that only God can do. Here's where you pray, command this sickness to leave this person in the name of Jesus Christ. I take authority over every spirit attacking my kid, attacking my mind. You, there's no devils here now. You are alone with God. You are submitted more than you could ever be. And now you're just praying miracles. And you want those prayers to be answered. You go through that process. God's going to hear that prayer. And you pray. And there's situations you know about. I don't. Things I know about you don't right now. And man, when I get to that holy of holies, when I get to that Aaron's rod, man, I'm just naming. That guy needs to be healed in the name of Jesus. I take authority over that disease. And I'm just hitting it until it breaks. And it will break. And it breaks. And when they would... Get done. Right before they would exit, they would look up and woven into the top of the ceiling of the curtain were angels. And this is where you pray, angels of the Lord to be with me today. When I go out of this prayer meeting, God, there are angels in here tonight. They're all over this room. They're way up high, but they're all over this room. And he's, you pray, God, let your angels go with me today. Let them go with my kids. Let angels be with us. Protect us in the car. Protect us in the meeting. Protect us at the store. Let angels go. And whoever comes to your mind, let angels be with Bishop and Sister Foster today. Wherever, let angels whisper to them things they need to do or things they need to, whatever they need. God, let angels be right there with them. And now you step out of your prayer meeting into your day. Hell going to have a bad day. Now I just went through a lot of... If you want your prayer life to go from five minutes to five hours or from 30 minutes to an hour and a half, if you, if you fall asleep seven minutes into prayer meeting, here's a pattern for you. You don't have to be bored praying. Effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Bishop, you correct me if I'm wrong, but every time I do the tabernacle prayer, I break through at least one time, if not multiple times. Every time, the Spirit of God will come in my prayer room and bomb me, and I will weep before him. T not today, I'm just giving you an example. And I'm going to give the bishop. Today, I was praying, and I was on the part of the table of showbread, and I was praying for a uh, global revival. And out of nowhere, I mean, I, I hadn't broken through the whole time. But I'm just, I'm just hitting my list. And out of nowhere, it just came out of me. God, every dream Steve Willoughby had for Singapore, I pray for it to break open starting tonight. And 
Steve Willoughby was a missionary to Singapore. If you ever, if you know who he was, he and his wife, they both died way too young, and they were powerful. They outworshipped everyone I know except for Bishop. They were crazy worshipers, and they had such revival, and they died of cancer too young, and they had such vision. And out of nowhere, I began to travail in that house tonight. I began to wail over what Steve Willoughby prophesied us, and before long, I am just praying for Singapore. Like, and, I, you, and you think that's crazy, but you should try getting in the spirit. Because God will take you. And one day you'll be praying for that. And the next day you'll be praying so hard for Bishop or for someone across the aisle in the church. And you don't even know what's going on in their life or why their name's on your mind. But because God can trust you, because you're praying his way, he brings names to you that he knows only what's going on. And because you pray, he answers the prayer. And they'll never know you were the one. Stand to your feet right now. I'm going to give this to Bishop, but I want to pray this on you. I did the best I could. There's so much more I probably left out. He told me, he told me, like he did with the fasting, that if I live it, I can impart it. I'm living it. I'm living this prayer. You can do this. You can be a prayer warrior. You can be a prayer warrior if you want to be. Stop making excuses. There's so many needs out there that we've got to hit. If you're ready to walk in it, would you raise your hand? By the authority of the word of God and the power of the name of the Lord Jesus, I impart the tabernacle prayer right now into people's lives and hearts and minds. I pray for prayer lives to go deeper, to go longer as of right now. I pray that people would have encounters with you starting tomorrow morning that they would never, ever have without this message tonight. I pray that you would bring people in the spirit. Let them read their Bibles like they've never read. I pray for people tonight to pray for others like they've never prayed. I pray for deep repentance. He called, hey, Shakai, to hit everybody in this building until flesh dies and the spirit lives. I pray not my will, but thy will be done in every home, in every man, every woman every boy and every girl and i release this right now in the name of jesus there's a voice calling me from an old rugged tree and it whispers, draw closer to me. Holy of Holies is available in your house every morning. Ark of the Covenant, Jesus' name, power of God, miracles. I've had prayers, Bishop, where I've prayed in the Holy of Holies. And in that same day, six things I asked for were answered that day that were impossible except for only God. Six times. I've had so many days where two, three, four prayers were answered the same day. The Lord has been calling this church to deeper prayer, to hold the heights of revival that he's sending to you. God bless you tonight, Bishop. Do what you feel.